lucky to have Brad Fisher and Maria Jose Morda as our tech gurus to give us lots of useful information today. Just to let you know, we are filming this uh, to be either sent out or placed on the web so that if um, you want to go back over something or you want to share it with, with a partner or a friend who couldn't be here, we have that for you. Okay? And with that, um, all right, good morning everybody. So the goal today is more of just a very basic introduction to a few different areas. Um, some of it's based off the questions we saw last time, and some of it will be more of our program because we always want to be sure everybody knows what we're doing at school. This is a school type uh, communication, as well as we are filming, we're trying to run a new gadgets for primary school today, so if you see the iPad, we'll be around that as well. But uh, besides that, we also want to give you guys some tips. Uh, we also want to look at and make sure that you guys are aware of things that you can do at home, based off the last lecture, as well as what the school has done in school of a similar route. Um, we're also going to provide you with some statistics, because I did feel like the last conversation, some people were concerned about screen time. So that's something I've actually gotten down and looked at stuff over two weeks that should help clear up some of that anxiety over how much is being done at school, which will probably surprise So. Real quickly, an overview. Our school right now, in the primary years, they have iPads for KG and also the preschool years. When they get to grade four or one to four, they're using Chromebooks. Grade five, we switched uh, last year to Windows, and that was just to help with the transition from primary to secondary, which has really been helpful for the kids having the first time of having an operating system. It's made that transition much, much easier. And then also, once we get to grade six to 12, we have the traditional bring your own laptop which has become really, really popular in the international market. Uh, some schools provide laptops, some bring your own, but it seems to be the direction that everybody's kind of gone for the major schools. But you'll notice on the uses, uh, some people ask, why do kids have devices at such a young age? There is actually a lot of uses. I've been in the classroom. It's quite amazing to watch little preschoolers or kindergartners be able to work an iPad around and be able to do activities the most basic things, numbers, lettering, identification, um, they're developing motor skills. Motor skills is that eye-hand coordination that when we get into the Chromebook years or into the laptop years, you need. You need to be able to look at it. If you see something, to be able to move your hand to the right spot. Not only that, they're getting identification skills and art skills that they traditionally would we have to generate a bunch of papers to do. Or if we did, we would not have the tool sets or they have crayons and markers, and the next thing you know, your entire classroom looks about well, like preschoolers went running around with markers and crayons. It has helped on that. They're very, very good about it. Our Chromebook ears, which Ms. Moore works with extensively on, it starts to get kids ready for the real world of laptops. And this is where they're introduced on a much, much more basic level, how to do document processing, typing, which we work with kids, uh, what's it, once, twice a week? Once a week, 20 minutes. Once a week for 20 minutes. So they are starting to get used to where the keys are. Uh, the math and reading apps and portfolios that they start to do, which goes all the way to grade five. When we get to those grade five years, it continues to build on these uh, skill sets, but the operating system, as I said earlier, was really the big thing. Uh, we, we found in my first few years watching, kids get to secondary, and it's already tough enough trying to learn how to lockers, going to classes on your own, and just being able to adjust to an operating system which might seem something very common to you, was not for the kids coming from Chromebooks. So we did start doing that earlier. And then when we get to the secondary, the reason we have those minimum specifications, and they are a little bit stricter than a lot of the other schools where we require a little more horsepower is because, honestly, some of the software, which Ms. Moore will be telling you about a little bit, is a lot more advanced. I mean, if we put Adobe on a kid's computer and they're using it design to create the most amazing illustrations or 3D printing or they're in music and they're, they're doing advanced uh, notation software, it does require some horsepower on those laptops. So notice on the far right, screen time. And that is what we watched on the video at the last time. It was a huge topic of how much screen time. There is probably a huge conception at the school, and you might see walking around that kids are spending all day long on their laptops. It's just factually not true. If I watched over the two week period and I looked at pre-K and PhD, you know, I have something on their iPads of how often they're used, down to literally the minute, less than 30 minutes a day. Uh, many days they don't use it. For the grades one to four, it's about 40 or 50 minutes. And I would simply say on this, when I was watching it, there'd see days where, hey, I'd see it on two periods, and then the next day there'd be no periods. And a lot of that, as Ms. Moore alluded to earlier when we were talking about this, has to do with whether they were doing languages. 
They were doing, you know, uh, Sinhala on the day of French. They typically seem to use it in that class. And then their core class instruction, they might be using it for maybe an ISL day or a Rouse Kids day, which is the same in math. But it is not that they're spending all day long doing that. There, there's so much more that they still need to cover beyond the curriculum of doing what's on the laptop. Uh, grade five is no different. And then for the secondary, the secondary is a hit or miss. The secondary I saw where we have a half a day, the kids would be on it, but we only two blocks on four blocks. The next day, there might be none. And the next day, one block. And because of that seven day crazy rotating schedule we have here, there's no way that we really can communicate from teacher, okay, you're using the computer today, so I can't use it. It's not how the system is set up. It would be too, too complex. But overall, if I looked at it over a two week period, there was not one single grade, including my DP ones and twos, which would be my most heavy users, that was using it for more than two periods a day. And on most days, it was just one 90 minute block. If you averaged out, it might be 30 minutes of one lesson in one period, maybe 45 minutes of another period. And that's what it would stay on. Just wanted that to be aware for you guys uh, as the parents, uh, as we continue to talk about screen time and at school. Yes, we are all in on technology, and it is a great, great tool. But we still have paper and pencil. We still have uh, whiteboards that we use. We still have just classic projections that they'll use a projector for. It's not the only source of teaching. And the best part about teaching is you have to use constantly change your instruction around so kids are exposed to new ways of, as a teacher to deliver the instruction and also to receive it. That keeps them so that they don't get bored and tuned out and then stop paying attention, which some kids will still do, but uh, this lesson that it, we're constantly rotating around. And I, I've been into a number of the classrooms, and I can tell you no two classrooms are alike, no two teachers are alike, but overall, if you look out the long span, they're not using it that terribly much. The devices at OSC, so I got this little photo at 9 a.m. This year was a huge year for our Wi-Fi. Uh, refresh. Uh, it was a time for us to kind of get rid of our old network. So we got all these nice new fancy toys that I like to play with because I am a bit of a geek. See all those dots up there? Those are devices on our network at 9 a.m. It might look like a lot of to you. 9 a.m. is usually one of my, my peak hours on my network traffic, especially on a Monday morning and a Friday morning. Don't know why, it's just always been like that for four years. But if you think about it, if each and every one of those dots are a person or a device, I have 420 kids, 150 staff members, like 650 to 700 people at any time on campus who probably should be connected to the network, whether it's through their mobile phone or their laptop. It's actually not that many. On a typical day, at any given time, there's only about 200 devices, which is about a quarter to a third of who's actually on campus connected to our network. So while we could support on any day, if I had every single kid connect to our network this year, had every single staff member connect two devices to the network, we would be able to handle it easily. The facts are, most days, it's only a percentage. And then you're looking at 25 to 33% of the people on there at any time is actually using the network. Another proof of thought as far as the screen time. So our infrastructure, just to get you guys aware of, of the school changes, because while we have communicated on this newsletter, uh, this was a huge, huge year. It's probably the biggest year I've ever done in my career. Um, as far as technology changes, we did about six big changes to start the school year. Normally, we only do one or two. So there was a lot of sleepless nights for me on this. We did get our uh, bandwidth upgraded to 450. And if that means nothing to you um, in a school system, your goal is basically for each and every kid to have at least one megabit uh, dedicated to them. That's kind of the standard barrier where you know you've actually reached that pinnacle as a school. You've made it into a tech program. Very, very few schools hit there. Uh, I'm American, so I came from the state side. And, and the school districts I worked at struggled to get that. So for us to be here at Sri Lanka, where we actually have, where we got everything covered and we're actually now working to the park where we're staff, it is a huge thing. It means your kids can access streaming media, which is very popular if you use it in the right way, uh, multimedia, download software, be able to upload things to the cloud quickly. It, it's a huge barrier. The other thing is this year we completely redid our network. Um, and I kind of pitched it to my boss, uh, Mr. Jocelyn. I want the whole campus that wherever you walk to, you always have Wi-Fi so that the kids commonly will do projects, not in the classroom, but they'll do specialty projects such as uh, filming for presentations or creating uh, something that in a, a different classroom. Or they might be near a closet or they might be in the cafeteria or the canteen or we might put four of your kids in here. But the school can be able to support it. The real whole goal is for us to be able to do, if we ever do a large scale event or when we bring in these sites of events, for us to be able to support anything that we need to large or small at any time. 
So the acceptable use policy was the next thing that came up. And this is something that was crafted when I first started here. It was crafted with about 12 teachers who sat in a committee, and I showed them a whole bunch of different acceptable use policies. And as I said, I came from America, so the school district I was working at was extremely conservative. They had a, a do not do this, do not do that list that was seven, eight pages long, and the employee handbook one was about 10 pages long. So I showed them examples of that, and then I also showed them some very uh, progressive ones that are more into being uh, a good digital citizen, making good choices, uh, but didn't really have any teeth to it. And then after they looked at everything, they kind of came with a combination. So we drafted this three or four years ago, and it's actually stood, since then, there has not been any big uh, modifications that needed to do to it, but this is uploaded on the school website. In addition, it's referenced each and every year in the primary programs the teachers go over with it. In the secondary, uh, the design department does it for grades 6 to 10. And then we also have all students sign off on it. So once a year, after we, we reviewed it with all the parents, or all the kids, on their laptops or on the Chromebooks, it'll actually pop up. And they will have to accept that they've read the terms and conditions, and it saves a little electronic time, uh, time stamp. And all year long, if they get a new laptop or anything of that nature, any device that they get onto it that's a computer, they'll do the same thing. If they don't accept it, they don't get on the network which, of course, everybody accepts it because they do need that. But uh, some important points on this. The first one is that it includes all electronic devices. That does include mobile phones. At the beginning of the year, I'll sit down with all teachers, and I give my one senior speech uh, where I go through all the summer changes. And by the very end of it, every teacher looks exhausted because I've just hit them with so much stuff. Before I get to that, the very first thing I outline each and every year is our acceptable use policy and what the uh, requirements are for teachers both new teachers and existing teachers. Cell phones do come up every year. Students should only have electronics out when a teacher tells them to. It does cover cell phones. So if there's a perception that kids are using cell phones constantly in class, if the teacher has said you can use it, and there are times in an educational setting where actually it does make sense, such as doing those presentations where you need to do a quick little recording and you need to use whatever features you have on your phone to do so. That typically happens in the DP or the NYP upper year programs. I've seen them do it out in the garden. But outside of that, a student should not have it out. Uh, students, without the teacher giving them that express consent for just that lesson, it's not supposed to be out. And that doesn't just apply to cell phones, but it applies to every kind of technology device. So if you think of iPads, laptops, whatever it may be, it covers a whole spectrum. In the classroom, I've always believed you've got to give teachers flexibility because you have different teachers with different styles, with different ways to deliver stuff. And so I've never wanted to create a policy that was do not, do not, do not. I believe if you put the power into the teacher, they'll be far more productive and you'll get far better creative classes. But there are some teachers who you'll never see a laptop out but a couple times a year. And there are some teachers who will never let you use a cell phone. And unless that teacher says so, it should not be done. Now, of course, we still have some work to do. Uh, it was brought up, what about breaks or lunches? I do know in the break periods, for example, primary last year, the kids were running over top of each other to get Minecraft, which we'll talk about a little bit. I mean, they're really into it. I always got trampled, and these kids are half my size. They stampeded towards it one day when it's working on it. Um, I do know Mr. Grandboss uh, set a policy for primary where you could only go in there one day a week to be able to use it. So there are, we do pay attention to that. In the secondary program, I know uh, the administration has tried and to encourage kids to get outside. Uh, we kind of hampered down the student center where kids were just messing around with computers, um, as well as the corridors where they might be hiding out. So we are on a school effort constantly reminding kids to get out. We shouldn't be using the, the tech for fun stuff during breaks. But it is always an area we're constantly improving in, and it's a bit of a challenge because this is a big campus. And obviously between 9 and 925, we've got kids all over the place. And the little ones really, really are serious about that Minecraft. <laughs> um, for you guys as parents, I just will say this while I have you all in the room, it is always at the end of the day your requirement to make sure when you get to secondary that you supply them a laptop. And each and every year we have laptops break. It happens. It's dropped, spill things, whatever it may be. If it's only a couple days, the school can always do a lender laptop. They're not great. They're like horribly shaded red or a, a really obnoxious blue color. It stands out. Uh, they're slow. They can't be go home, they'll just literally leave alone for class. But if you ever get into a scenario where it's going to be out for weeks, which usually means that it was a, a pretty big, severe thing, you as a parent needs to find a substitute. You just don't have the supplies here. Those are first come, first serve, and they can't even come home. So each day they're different. 
Uh, say, for example, we're doing testing with map testing, so all of my backup inventory is up there doing makeup map testing. And so every day is different. I just want to make sure that you as parents, except use policies for kids, but you are aware there is a little parent component that is kind of a big thing. So, safeguards at school will be the next thing to talk about. Because there is always an anxiety of, well, what's the school doing to protect my kids online? Well, everybody has a different philosophy. Schools typically, and, and I include myself on this, when it comes to tech at school, we always try to err on the side of caution when it comes to security, when it comes to filtering. This might not be perfect in every scenario. And I do not want to stand up here and say, I can absolutely guarantee 100% of the time your kids will not get on any bad. I couldn't say that because I know when I was 16 years old, I always drive my tech director nuts every time he would block something. I would find a way around it, and then he'd drive me into the principal's office, and it wasn't like that for two years. Kids are creative. They're smart. And I, there are about a dozen or so kids here who are tremendously smart with technology. What we do is do a multi-layer van where we have different filters and different schemes that try to help prevent. But we also do try to educate. So we start out with policy and acceptable use. Everybody gets that. The next thing is we go to education where teachers are teaching kids how to be good digital citizens. This really starts and is hampered into the primary years. Uh, Every year we do a few tech talks in secondary, for example, yesterday I sat with seventh grade, and we actually talk about what is a digital citizen. That is the person's online role, what they're like when so they're on the internet. It, it's a goal of us to continue to try to do something. They learn to not be what we call a troll online. Has anyone ever heard of troll? Trolling? It's where you go out and start posting really obnoxious or cyber ruling people that you don't know because they can't see your face. And our goal is to try to teach kids that's the problem. Is no different than walking up to a person and, and saying the same words, which most kids would never do. We do then have classroom management. As I said, the policy, we want each and every teacher to have control of their classroom. And ultimately, when it comes to tech, on that initial level, they are in control. They're vigilant. You know, teachers are trained to whenever they're teaching, they walk around the room. They circulate the, their environment. It makes kids so they're aware of the presence. Teachers will look at the screen. They'll have their screens open. They usually, typically, most classrooms can see their screens based off where their desk is. In addition, we have a few things running on the background level that adds those added layers. So those are kind of my areas. The first is our web filtering, which we changed this summer. Um, it's called Palo Alto. It is an absolutely amazing firewall system. I haven't had any issues yet this year with kids kind of breaking it. I know at some point they will get around it, but at least, knock on wood, nine months or seven weeks into school, they have not yet. That was changed from last year, and a lot of more of this was to be uh, reported. So that if there is an incident, I can be able to respond to it accordingly a lot more. The second one is Impira, and this is a software base. So Impira is this little thing that basically on any of the technology computers, we have constantly where we can see every screen next to the network at any time in school. It doesn't matter whether it's a Chromebook, an iPad, a laptop. What the kids do, we can see. And we just kind of let it go. It runs in the background. If the kids do something foolish, for example, let's say grade five ended up doing the annual once a year birds of the bee talk. Afterwards, each year, it always happens. Kids get curious and start searching around. It would instantly alert me once a year, and it does every single year, where I'll just have a series of screenshots of what the kid typed into Google that they were trying to look at. They aren't able to see it because safe search is a source on Google and YouTube, so they can't really get to anything. But I am then aware, and then I immediately let the teachers know, hey, this occurred at this time. This is a screenshot of what the kid was looking like at. Is that conversation with it? That's kind of a normal, typical what will happen in any school. It's not at the for here. I've seen it uh, in my previous job. And many other tech directors deal with that kind of on a daily basis. But it also alert me to other things, such as, let's say, if kids start to search for suicide, and keep searching for it and searching for it. It might be perfectly uh, related to an educational topic. But it would alert me, so I'm aware of it, and then I can talk to guidance and the teacher to figure out this is part of the lesson, are they researching something on psychology, or is this a kid looking on something on their own? So it's a very, very wide range. It's a UK product. I've used it in a number of incidents over the past few years where we've had miscellaneous stuff or kids bullying, such as if they type in a curse word, it lets me know, or some of the more serious stuff, which does happen a couple times a year. It's unavoidable when you're dealing with protecting teenagers. Uh, they don't always okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Moore. She's going to talk to you guys a bit about the systems we have at school because it is a good refresher for you guys to see. While we are talking about screen time and there can be no negatives of kids doing too much, there are a lot of positives. And I do always want to remind parents to give that counterbalance of, yes, we have this and there are dangers, but there are also dangers when you drive in a car. It doesn't mean we stop. It just means we have to work to drive better. 
no different in a school system to pick software that makes sense and systems that end up working with kids so that they're being educated and it's just not a waste of money where they're using the system. Just more. Yes, so the idea is to show you what are the systems and the systems and the applications that the students are using that are common to all the grade levels. The first one that we do is Google Apps for Education. It's a little bit different from a regular Gmail account. I know that all of you maybe have Gmail accounts, but that is uncontrolled. It's not a, it's controlled because it is your personal account. Google Apps for Education is the same environment but controlled by the school. So we, the school, are the ones that allow the students to go to several websites. For instance, if they are looking on Google search using the school account, it prevents the students to see a lot, or to see as users, a lot of publicity in the Google search. So we use this extensively from grade one to grade five. Everything is in Google, we use Google Drive. That is also something that we are going to see later on that is protected and we can see everything they do with that account. Every student studying in KG has an account. That has an account doesn't mean that they can use the email. We don't introduce email until the end of grade two, more or less. They don't need to use it, okay? So this is the first thing. Then we go, also we have the same account because now we, if you, if you have seen your kids, I don't know, we have the same account my account is mjmora at osc.lk. It's the same account in the office or Office 365 environment. This software is extensively used in secondary school. What it allows us to do, because we have Office 365, is that our students can download Excel, Word, PowerPoint, Publisher, the asset you see here, yeah? So they can install it in their own laptops. Yeah, it is protected again, it is, again, the same school controlling the accounts, and everything is controlled by the technology department, and we try to also help them out. Um, then we have the Adobe Suite. Uh, maybe you have heard Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, Adobe Premiere. That is something that, thank God, and I am so happy because now we have the license and we can have it for all the students in secondary school. As it is a heavy uh, machine requirement it has, we can only use it in the students that bring their, their own laptops. Still, we have some problems with the, with the computer. It's not with the best requirements, but it works fine. So we are using it, in, especially in design, but our idea is also that the Adobe Suite can be used for any other subject. We teach them in design how to use Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, in design, um, Premiere, that is the one to do movies, and the idea is that they can use it in other, in other so, only for secondary school. We tried last year <laughs> in grade five because I wanted to introduce them to Photoshop. It was chaos because the machines are little and it wasn't enough for what we wanted them to do. So we had to go back to one that is offered for Chromebooks that I'll talk to you in a minute. Uh, now, this is something that is important. It's teacher time. This is the way we can control the use of the Google accounts of our students in primary. As you can see, teacher dashboard is like a lens where the teacher can see everything the students are in a very easy environment for the teacher. So one teacher that has the class, they can see the folders of the kids in one screen. They can see the Gmail account, so they see what email they are sending, receiving, or giving even. So everything in just one screen, so it's controlled. Okay, so we have, okay, we have had some cases in the past where the students were sending nasty emails. We told them, it is controlled, we can see. Okay, so they know, and they know that it's controlled. So this is a teacher dashboard. If I go back a little bit here. Can you see that from the home as well? Should they log on as well? No, because it is a teacher tool. Yeah, so it is a, it's under the name of the teachers. If you see this, This Google Classroom is a product from Google that was created based on DigiDiver. Because DigiDiver has a as a company in, located in Australia, and they started first because they saw the potential on using Google Drive in the classroom. So after that, three years ago, Google decided to have one that is Google Classroom. We are still with this. I now I, I took a workshop and I worked with Google Classroom. I think teacher dashboard is still easier to use as a teacher. 
But okay, but this is to let you know that we can see everything they do in their accounts as teachers. Okay. Sorry, okay. if they log on to their Gmail account at home, you can't see anything. The thing is that what you see is that the student don't see anything. The student doesn't know that they are being controlled. If they go and you log into 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 just your account, you just see Google Drive, you just see the Gmail apart as applications, but the teacher has a console or a that. When I any dog down last night, she was doing some good with at school. She could she could see everything from school. She she said she was showing me. Yeah. And her friend was online as well and they were they were communicating via the school network, she said. No, no, the school network. They are using your 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 school My network. Wi-Fi. What they can use is because the folders and the Google Drive is created by us. So that they can see all that, even though she's on my Wi-Fi. That's in your Wi-Fi. At, at home is in your Wi-Fi. Right. Right. But you can't see that at school, and whatever she's doing, you can't see that. Mm -hmm. What we can see is after the teacher can see what she has done. Okay, when they, when they open what's like, called the dashboard, yes, they can see the latest things that they did. What okay. she's saying is, if she logged in her Google account at home, she does something on Google or a spreadsheet or whatever that thing, mm -hmm. because it is a school Google account, it's a Google server, and it's linked to that teacher dashboard, she would be able to see any activity done on that yeah. Okay, but then also your, your son or daughter would also be able to see anybody within that Google classroom as well that, that's been set up. So if you say you've seen uh, other things linked to other case counts, that's because it's, it's a Google account, and wherever you're at, as long as you're logged in with Google account, you can see what's going on. It's exactly like a Gmail account, but it's protected because it belongs to the school. That's the only difference, yeah. And maybe they are using what's called Google Hangouts that they can take a of each other. Okay, so this is only for grade one, five. Okay, now ManageBack. Okay, I think that all of you are familiar with ManageBack. ManageBack is our uh, online platform system. What we do there is communications, assessment, reporting, so the students know. This is only for secondary school, okay? In primary, it's only for reporting. Each of you should have a username and a password. When you log in, you can see the information related to your kids. In secondary school, you can see assessments, you can see homework, you can see the, the, the calendar, etc. And in primary, right now it's only used for reporting, but they are moving to do also the curriculum there. Uh, management is integrated and there's only one login that they have to use and that is important. We don't have to have the, the username and the password for Google, the username and the password for Microsoft and the username, no. Everything is with the same username and password. Yeah. Okay, I'll take that same slide. So just curious, uh, because this is my baby for the year, this was a four-year project for us to finally get out of school. For a number of years had issues with student information systems. You don't know what that is. It's like the core of the school, like the brain where all the data goes. How many of you guys are now on iSAMS as a parent? Either an app or a web portal. Okay, about seven out of 10. So that's actually kind of what I'm looking at on the stats. If you aren't on it, please, please get on it. Uh, if, if you haven't gotten the email or you lost the email, please do so. This is gonna be kind of the, the source when we build anything future as, as we look at re-looking at our business office software or when we look at something new. All the data is going to kind of come from this. So when you apply and open apply, all that data gets shifted to iSAMS, and then all the systems that we are looking at will come and send data to and or from iSAMS as the main source. But for you as parents, it's, it's a very much a pastoral care. Uh, when we closed school a few weeks ago, that app instantly notified, uh, at the time it was about 150 people, close to 200 now, people on our Mac, or they got a little app alert on the phone of, hey, we're closing school tomorrow. So if for no other reason, that one feature really, really makes it worth it, but it's also gonna be the place where when you update your email, it instantly syncs immediately to manage back, open, apply, your canteen account, and hopefully soon we'll get into a few more systems on it. So if you aren't on that system, I do ask you to do so. Um, ASA is currently be done on it, service learning. Communication is gonna be a, a year-long process with our school. We will be switching slowly to our parent communication where the teachers send out through that. That's um, just using your email address so we aren't running a parallel system where we've done an independent thing where it's far more like to have errors. All of it is uh, family information. So if you see something not right, you can either let us know or do a form to be able to fix it. Many times there's a lot of data that is incorrect and I can only make a system as good as the data that's in it. So this is your way to be able to check what we have on records as far as billing, our way to be able to send stuff back to you. 
just please, please, if you're not on it, get on it. If you guys are on it, uh, so far the feedback's been pretty positive of, as far as the app. But, sorry, this is a long time ago. I think yeah, it's an Android, so what? Both. Both. Uh, there's about 300 people registered for the web, only about 200 for the app. It takes both iOS and Android. Once you get on the web, you can go to the app. You can't edit information. You cannot edit information. They're coming with a release on that. It'll happen some point this year on the app. The app's more for the notifications and learn. So is something wrong? You go through the web. No, you go through, there's a web portal you can update it okay. on that. They are changing for the app so you can do it on the app. It's just not out yet. At some point this will be here. All right, that's all I wanted to say on that one, just to make sure it's on everybody's radar. This is a really, really important uh, system currently and then for anything we build in the future. Okay, now there are certain systems that we are offering to students uh, as a resource to, in, to help them in their student learning depending on the top. I will tell you something that we are using now from grades KG up to grade 8. Last year we were only offering to KG up to grade 5 and this year the math department <coughs> in secondary school as a have also for grade 6 to 8. So this is, again, is just to support what they are learning. And it is fun, that's what the kids say, that is fun. So it is a nice uh, website that they can use. Uh, this is something that we expect them to do something at home. And sometimes I know that there are parents that want to use it at home. We expect them to use it at home, but of course that it is something that is not mandatory. But we hope that we use the teachers will be telling the students what they want and their expectations in terms of the time that they want them to do IXL. Uh, we also have something for reading. In this basket, it only goes from KG up to grade five. If you see here, we are offering for KG. KG has it in the iPads. So as the students in KG have the iPads, they use the iPad to access uh, rice kids and IXL. Okay, and it is an app that also can be used if the students in other levels, they have it in the iPad, they, there's an app also for them. Um, then we have the import of photos. This is something that uh, works for primary. We use Blogger, and I know that Blogger is open. Blogger is not exactly Google, it's an add-on. So we use Blogger, but it took time for us to get to have a Blogger that was protected for the kids. When you open a blog in Blogger, it is open to the community. So what we do is the blogs are created by us, and we control what they are posting on Blogger. This is for just for reflection. One of the things that we said is we don't want something that is not digital to take a picture and make it digital and write on that. What we are pretending is what they do that is digital is digital and reflect on that in the blog. So this is we're using from grade two to five, and as you can see, it has a privacy privacy setting that is not listed on blogger and nobody can search by the name of the student or something because it's protected. So we will use it as e-portfolio only. And for little kids, we are using Seesaw. It's another app also to create e-portfolios, also protected. It's even more protected than the other one. And it's very easy to use. The students love it. And this year, we are going to make a pilot with KG. We are going to start with them in the second semester because there's also an app that comes from the iPad. So then the transition can be easier for them to when they get to grade one, at least the jargon is something that they are used to. Uh, this works kind of the same as Blogger, but it's a lot, lot simpler than Blogger. Then we have Typing Club. This is something that we started last year. I think we think that it's important to help the students improve the time with their typing skills. We are offering right now mandatory for grades one to five. And the idea is that they work 20 minutes in the school and hopefully 40 minutes at home. It doesn't have to be the 40 minutes at once. It can be 10 minutes every day, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that at least they have one hour of practice uh, of typing skills in by their own. Uh, it is important because I think you know, for all of us that use typing club or, or didn't use, you can see the difference when you can use a uh, great typing instead of just doing this. Yeah, so we offer this year to grade six. Some students are using it now. Um, uh, that is an educational program, is everything online. Again, some of these apps, it's important to know, Raskids doesn't have connection with the account. Unfortunately, it's the only app right now that they need a separate username and a password. 
and sometimes a little bit cumbersome because the student one is my username here. We try to have the same username as they have in the in Google, but it makes a difference because we see Raspix has its own conditions when they are we are creating accounts. So typing job goes with Google, so it is and what we do in grade one, it is important. With grade one is not that we sit down them to, to put their hands, no. They start with games, and the games come in type of cup, okay? So they just, is, they're learning where the keys are. We are not expecting them at all in grade one, not even at the beginning of grade two, to be sitting down like this, yeah? So we tell them what is an ergonomic way of using the table, the chair, but, but uh, not necessarily. At the end of grade two is when they are going to start putting their hands as they should be, okay? Then, these are also things that are important for our department to know. These are uh, resources that the library offers as public databases or paid databases. They are under the umbrella of the library, and here you can see what we have. And if you see this is are other resources that library can use. Uh, I held in the library sometimes, and we have sessions where we told it, we told and it showed that the students how to use it when they are doing research. Uh, for instance, if you see, they, oh, they use web, web, web packets, for instance, to discover they are close by what you can do in Google, but in a safe environment. Still, at the end of grade uh, five, we are having some sessions with them when we teach how to use Google in a proper way, how to do a, a smart uh, key search, etc. But these are things that they can use, and they can use it at home without any problem. This is something that uh, I had a conversation last week with the parents in KG. Uh, KG and preschool, yes, they have the iPads, but we want to have also is to break a little bit the idea that the iPads are used in the school only as toys. And there is an award when they are doing fine, take your iPad and do something. We are using the iPads also for improving or helping them in creating. The idea is to create content, yeah, and with apps that are very simple to use, we have, for instance, they record themselves and they do little videos and they can do it with their own iPad. And if you see, we have this classification of different apps and these are the apps that we officially allow them to use in the iPads in the school. There are certain games sometimes that they can use, but for creation and creating content, these are the ones that we, that we use. We create stories, uh, we do filming, we teach them how to take the iPad even with preschool. We teach them how to take the iPad and it's ready for them. And how to take a selfie. We introduced the concept of selfie last week with them. And we created a short story about what is, uh, I am, my name is Maria Jose Mora, I am from Colombia, blah, blah, blah. And uh, for the unit that they were working with that was is, uh, who, are, who, who we are. Yeah? So depending on, what the, on, the, on the need, we choose an uh, iPad app that can help them in that specific thing. Okay, going back, this is in general what we have, but it's important also for you to know that in primary, depending on the unit, I sit down with the teachers and we find different apps that maybe are not here. And we use it, sometimes it has to work. We have to change that. Or sometimes we say, okay, we can have it and we start using it periodically. Uh, for instance, with all the grades, we are using now something that is called Spark from Adobe, and they create videos, they create posters, they create uh, little websites, and it is also in a controlled environment because in that case, what we do is we create an account for them, and they have to use that account. So, in terms of this, every day we find new apps that we can use. We always try, and if they are successful, they come become part of this set of apps. Okay, that's. So, um, you're probably overwhelmed after that little part. So, um, if you didn't understand anything we've said in the last 10 minutes, just know we do a lot of stuff here. They're not just toys, and it, it goes from pre-K all the way to 12th grade. Uh, sometimes even for us who, who run it, it, it can be a little overwhelming, just how many different things it takes to run a school as far as apps and software and systems to make it all work. But it is quite normal in the school system. So the second part of this is we're now going to start switching towards trying to educate you guys a little bit more about what's going on with the kids in tech. Um, starting out really with uh, social networking. So as I said, I did something with seventh grade yesterday, and each year I kind of do this speech where I'll sit down with my sixth and seventh graders, 
and then uh, kind of look at where the trends lines are. For example, last year I asked, and almost every kid admitted that they had access to a cell phone, which previously, well, the previous year, we were only about two thirds were. So we were always under the impression as an admin, not every kid in sixth grade had one. But last year, at least according to what the kids were saying, they had access to one. It. It, it's a, a constant tech talk that we do a couple times a year. One of the things we do ask is on social networking. Do you all know the age kid needs to be to register for social networking? Has anyone ever read the super duper duper long paper of consent? Okay, so I asked the kids that. Of course, I got the standard head down, kind of like they're in trouble and they don't know the answer. For pretty much anything, it's 13, or it's actually 13 with parental consent. So for seventh graders, most of them were 11, 12, 13 year olds, they were not actually old enough to be on this. Legally, they cannot be able to authorize and give this company permission to be able to use their photography or to use uh, their status updates or their content, whatever it does. But they are doing it. And I do want you to be aware 13 is the benchmark. And that's for pretty much all social networking apps. There are some that may have to be 18 to do so. Uh, some mobile apps as well. But I do want to educate you guys on that. Those lengthy, lengthy documents, your kids are essentially signing their rights away. Snapchat, has everybody ever heard of Snapchat? Okay, it's by far the number one app to use at OSC. So as I said at the beginning, I have all these nice little toys that lets me kind of calculate stats. Every summer, there's about a five day period where I'm traveling and it's like stat week for me. I'll look at every stat I can possibly find from kid usage, to software usage, to teacher usage, what systems are working, which ones, how much Google Drive is used, one drive for business, and it's how I'm able to formulate my next year's plan. I've done it every year running. This year, since we have a new firewall, I've been watching to just see how many things are blocked. We do block typically social networking for mobile phones. Snapchat is the number one at OSC. Snapchat, the kids have always been aware of, under the impression that if you take a photo, it deletes in 10 seconds. If you read their super, dink, super duper long mumbo jumbo legal paper, it says any content you put on there, they have the right to use. It doesn't actually mean they delete it, it just means it's deleted from your end. So if there's an interpretation on that, I need you guys to be immediately aware Snapchat does not delete photos. Facebook is the first one up there. It's not an application for people to post photos, videos, updates, and frame connections. I'm assuming almost everyone here has heard of Facebook. Strangely, it's down by 20% from when I started my career. So it used to be about 70, 72%, somewhere in that range of teenagers were using it. It's now down to just around 51%. Well, of course, when I asked kids yesterday, it seemed to actually match actually matched that. Only about half the table said that they were using Facebook. Instagram is very popular. It's very popular with their kids here. It's very popular worldwide. Uh, it's a photo sharing app. It's famous for filters. Uh, you might have ever heard of like Instagram models being famous, which is basically people posting photos of themselves, editing it, and then they have a bunch of followers who end up watching all the photos. YouTube is really, really popular for watching videos. But it's also popular and it's become a phenomenon for the younger, especially um, if any of you have teenage boys, where they'll, they'll play video games and then they'll actually just record their commentary. It's become this whole phenomenon in million dollar industries. They'll just spend all day, they will no longer play video games. They just watch another kid playing video games and getting play by play of them playing video games. I actually don't truly understand it unless I'm trying to, and I don't think I play video games if I'm trying to do a cheat code, but. They do it all the time. Once again, it's age 13 to sign up on. Um, this is obviously something just to be aware of because if your kid's a younger kid and they're recording themselves doing this, which in PlayStation, Xbox, um, mobile apps, they have the ability to be able to record, even on, a, of course, a computer, real time their game while simultaneously using a webcam with whatever they're doing. They put it up there on YouTube. Once again, Google owns YouTube. Anything you put on it, they essentially have the rights to. Even if you delete it, it does not mean it's completely and totally deleted. Yes? So you can't use YouTube at school? We do use YouTube at school. Okay, uh, this is something I, I took away my first year, but it was not due to concerns over it. For the YouTube, we automatically enforce a safe search filter. And so that means that Google educators or whoever at Google kind of decides what is content appropriate for safe search, which be for kids. And a lot of times I'll hear grappling, especially for my older kids, that hey, this was this is a perfectly legit video and it's blocked. And it does happen, but it does filter. If I typed in a search phrase that had five million normally, you might actually see a million afterwards. So it does 
cut down a lot of the bad. It's not guaranteed for everything, but we do use it here. Uh, and it is used heavily in the education market. But I do want you to be aware of this other side, what YouTube is being used, and this is especially true for teenagers recording themselves. And then it's not just video games. You'll have people just doing, you know, funny video little sitcoms, and some of them are all funny great. Uh, some of them will be doing relationship advice or just recording themselves doing hair or how to do your hair photos or whatnot. Uh, I don't understand those at all, obviously, but it is being done. I just need you guys to be aware as parents, it's a really popular trend. Snapchat, I did talk about um, the one other thing on Snapchat. The biggest concern always as a tech director I have is where you start seeing sexting incidents. And this is something that unfortunately does occur in schools. Uh, it's not a common thing, but in most schools you'll have an incident or two every year where a photo was taken that should not have been taken. Usually it occurs off campus, but then of course things quickly spread around and circulate and people start talking. Kids, because they believe Snapchat deletes it, which you don't actually know if they do or not if you read the, the terms and services, is the most likely for this app to occur. Now they'll also use it for filtering. It does a bunch of things where if you take a photo of me right now, I can instantly make myself look like a clown or fish or uh, my uh, eyes kind of looking like an alien. So there's all these filters and it, the main feature that they like is because it instantly deletes it after a couple seconds. But there are apps to get around that deleting in a couple seconds. You take a second phone, take a picture as you're looking at something, you have a permanent record. Just be wary of this one, okay? Uh, Twitter is also similar to Facebook, connects people all over the world. Uh, it's very famous for, it's become famous in America, obviously, for politicians who like to use it a lot because it's limited to the amount of uh, characters you can use it. So it's just a quick little snap, and then people get instantly linked to it, and you can follow it. It is used at uh, Canvas. I believe it is blocked on ours, as we do generally block the social networking. But I do know that we do other things where, uh, for example, Week Without Walls, where they're off campus with teachers when they do something of that nature. So it is used in an educational environment, but typically on this one, it's also kind of filtered through. Stats, as I said. So YouTube, 85% they use it. Um, I can guarantee you at the school, 100% of the kids use it. Uh, once again, it is uh, filtered out, so there is that safety code. And you see about a third of the kids say they use it as the most used social networking, which actually does kind of go align with what I saw in the seventh grade talk yesterday. Instagram has become really uh, popular. A lot of that is just kids are addicted to taking photos. And Instagram has some amazing uh, filters that can be able to pick a person who might have acne or blemishes or not look the best in a photo, and the next thing you know, they look like a million bucks. That's the, their marketing pitch, and I have to admit, it does work because it's being used so much. Snapchat is just said that's the main chat app. Okay, so that's not something you can type in snapchat.com and instantly get all the Snapchats going on. That is basically a mobile device. Facebook, um, they do have something called Facebook Messenger. So that's a chat app that they can use, but also Facebook, the web version. The chat app is used a lot uh, within the school. The Facebook uh, profile thing I don't see as much as I used to. Twitter, Tumblr, Reddit, and then none of the above. Or a few other things the kids said yesterday, like for example, they might be using WhatsApp, which they consider social networking. That's just a chat app, or a Line, or Viber, or things of that nature. Um, those are just, once again, no different than text messaging, but you can do group chats and video chats. So as I said, um, Facebook's dropped down. Snapchat, YouTube, and Instagram has steadily risen over the past few years since I started here. Uh, Twitter and Tumblr kind of remain a steady low. Um, those things seem to be for the older crowds. The next area I'm going to talk to you guys about, and this is really, I'm going to gear this one towards, uh, raise your hands, who's got teenage boys or preteen boys or if they're getting to that age? I did forewarn the seventh graders on this one. So I will fully admit, I played video games my whole life. Like when I interviewed with Mr. Jocelyn and he's asking me, well, what are your hobbies? I told him, oh, I'm a scratch golfer, I love golfing, I play video games. And Mr. Jocelyn, if you've met him or see him, he's, you know, um, older than me. Oh, you guys are not going to say that. <laughs> no idea what I was talking about with all that, but I love them. And I've been doing them since high school. But they're, they're a lot of fun to me. I can also say that these, what we're going to talk about, ESRB ratings, I got around at my age and the kids can get around very easily. If you buy a video game where you go out, go shopping with your kid, virtually any game that's published is going to have a little sticker, either on the front right hand side or the back hand right side. It's going to be this little square. There's six total that you need to look for. E for everyone means the littlest of your kids can look at it. Um, there aren't that many E for everyone games. And if there are, you're probably looking at like Nintendo Switch style games. Everyone 10 plus is a lot more commonality. Um, if you bought your kids a console like Nintendo Switch, 
many of those games will be for 10 year olds and above. And the main difference between the two is E for everyone is really like a learning game. But then plus might deal with something like a little bit of fantasy, like, oh, I'm a wizard, I'm walking around making a spell, or let me make something appear or disappear. It adds a fantasy element to it. T for teen, ages 13 and up. And this is where any kind of shooter game at minimum is going to hit this. And I can tell you, when doing the seventh grade chat yesterday, I was looking at all the games that the kids were playing, and the girls kind of sat at one table, and you could tell because they were playing very, very different genre games, and the boys all sat at other tables, and this wasn't done this way, they just did it. And the, boy, the boys' games were quite graphical. Um, as Mr. Frento could tell you when we were sitting in it, if a kid is watching constant violence, probably going to change them in some way on with the psychological thought process. There's enough research right out there that says it'll do it. Does it say, you know, it's, it's not going to make them violent. There's nothing I've ever seen that supports that. But it is going to possibly make them view things differently. Blood and gore. There are some games out there that if I would play, or I have played, it would scare me. So vampire games I won't go near, or the so-called Years of War that gave me nightmares whenever I was in college. And it was really, really scary. That's like 10 years ago. Imagine it now, 10 more years of doing this. So at the ages of 13 or above, this means it contains some suggestive, suggestive themes, uh, crude humor, some blood, uh, simulated gambling, or infrequent use of strong language. That's the bare minimum for T for 13, and some of those 13 games, honestly, I'm surprised they're not 17. These are evaluated independently. They have psychologists look at it. They have set criteria. They have game industry people look at it. But obviously, for the gaming industry, if they can hit that T for 13, they can sell more games than if they do for a 17-year-old game. Be wary. If you buy your kids gift cards, PlayStation, Xbox, iTunes, they don't need your permission to be able to go out and buy these games. Whereas many game stores in certain countries will require ID or require a parent to be there. If you're ever just loading up their, talking up their account on their PlayStation account or their Xbox account, they can buy whatever they want without being here. As long as they got funds, or if they get access to your credit card, they can get around these little things. These are suggestive guides. Not all countries enforce these. Not all places within countries enforce these. I know in America, I used to go to something called GameStop, and they wouldn't. But I also know there was a little uh, shop just down the road, a, a little supermarket, it was a little side shop, they sold games. They would not. So that's where the kids would go each time we had a major game coming out that was for these ratings. They get around it. So M for mature, those are my 17 year old up games. These things are include uh, intense violence, bloody war, sexual content, language, profanity. And then if you were actually hit the A for 18, then this game is just a parent's worst nightmare. It's something that basically would be the equivalent to a pornography or an all out literal killing. It, as graphical as you can get. Uh, there's, there's no better way to describe it. It's not suitable for kids. It shouldn't be a good looking at it. Not many games hit this barrier. Most of them say at the end for 17, but it is possible. Last one is a little not rated, which of course usually means they will switch it, but at the time when they first uh, came up with the game guide, or it probably hasn't been released yet, it hasn't come out there. <clears throat> Please be aware if you've got any discs at home on the boxes. If you've got a son or a daughter who has a game console, walk through and see on it. 13 is the minimum age, and of course, every kid situation is different. There are some kids at 13 who are more mature some kids who are at 16. And you, at the end of the day, as a parent, you've got to make a call. Um, there's, there's no legal law that says you can't. You're in control on this one, but I do need you to be aware there are ways kids can get around this. Sorry, Brad. Yeah. Is that gaming consoles? Do they have those on apps? Not for apps, but I have, for, let's say, some computer software games. Uh, so if you're downloading on a Mac or Windows, they'll have the SRP rate. For apps, well, yeah, uh, MJ's got something you can look at if you can look at that. So, popular games. This came up on the last discussion, and I did want to make you guys kind of aware of what are the kids playing. So, Fortnite, ages 13 or above, and I'm actually surprised it's not a little bit more. This is a first person shooter game. So, guns, blood, gore, killing. Not only that, you got people on microphones uh, saying some of the worst profanity of your, your life. Uh, the last game I played was Call of Duty, and I got chewed out by what sounded like an eight year old on a microphone. It cursed me six ways to Sunday. It happens when they, the kids get into lobbies and they have headphones and microphones, they're connected to anyone around the world. They have no control if they go into a general lobby and they're just playing online. You'll hear the microphones, you'll hear the, the, the discussions, and I'm telling you as an adult, some of those discussions were horrified as parents. Be wary of that. Okay. 
I'm not saying that it's always going to happen, but it does happen on the EV freeware. Grand Theft Auto is kind of the ultimate main game. Each four or five years, they come out with one. I will say there is only one positive I've ever found about GTA. I did learn how to parallel park through playing Grand Theft Auto. I swear on that. I told the kids that. Uh, I was uh, growing up in Pennsylvania where we had snow and ice storms, and I learned how to do the complete parallel park and deal with bad weather through GTA. It was at age 16. Outside of that, it is a horrible game for a person who's a 13, 12, 11, 14, 15 to be able to play. The kids can go out and buy prostitutes in the game and have real life simulations of what's going on. The kids can literally murder people. Uh, the kids can go to gambling institutes and learn how to gamble uh, a variety of different ways. Uh, the kids can go out and be drug dealers, sell drugs, buy drugs. I mean, this is a number two game worldwide being played. In 2018, they released this thing two years ago. It's still the second one, only Fortnite. When I asked yesterday the seventh graders, a bunch of them had played this. Be aware of it. If this is sitting around your house, ask them to play it. <coughs> yes, you can learn how to drive a car in parallel park. That is the one educational thing. And you do learn about the county because you have a wallet that you have to keep track of funds. Outside of that, almost everything was in this game for kids who are teenagers or preteens is inappropriate. Minecraft is, on the other hand, the opposite. So last year, a great uh, video of PYP exhibition. It was literally of my entire career, my years in IT uh, directors or coordinator roles. It's probably one of my most proudest moments because we had grade five kids come up. And they did this amazing Minecraft. And parents always think Minecraft is you walking around the store and hitting people and building stuff. But the kids actually ended up making, I believe it was a stadium. And they did a tour guide of just walking around and they recorded their video of this is what happens when you click this. And it was supposed to be an ancient civilization. And they did a full tour. It can be used for really, really positive educational things. You can go make rolling it. You, you can do a, a simulation of, hey, this is Colombo. Let's take a tour downtown. You can have those adverse and the creativity is there. So it is not just a pure game. There is a huge educational component to it. There's a coding component to it. Minecraft or Microsoft will be something where the kids can learn to code and actually build that code into their Minecraft worlds. There are positives here on Minecraft. It is for 10 plus because it's still with that fantasy, but I, I want you guys to be aware on that one.
Okay, so back to this board for some parenting tips. Okay, so as you said, it's very, uh, it's very important to have a Windows has a parental feature where you can kind of lock down on the screen time and what they're doing. 
Uh, it used to be part of the Windows Live Band, which is basically you registering a, a, a Windows account. So when they're signing in, uh, you can then set the parental controls. And that's free. Uh, any person with a Windows laptop can go ahead and set that up uh, through the control panel of your user account. So you'll see a little advertisement for this very feature. iPad just came out with new iOS, and they released something called uh, related to screen time or settings. So you can actually kind of monitor how much screen time and set yourself limits. Um, when we watched that video, it was kind of funny what people say, I have to download an app to control how much screen time I do. Basically, I need technology to manage my technology, which I found that amusing on it. But then sure enough, only a week after watching that, I've had released this. And this is one of the main things that they released on it. Paid software. There is a wide variety. I've used QStudio um, just as, as a practice run a couple years ago as a tech director. I was just looking at it because this, this question I get every year. It's about 60 US dollars but it supported all platforms, including mobile, so iOS, Android. It was really, really, really good. Unfortunately, most things that are great, you gotta pay for it. And so that one, I think, was about 60. Uh, Norton has a family teacher where you can kind of lock down websites. Uh, Kapersky has the same one, and uh, NetManny's been around for a number of years. All of those are paid. They've all been around, they're household names. Uh, at the end of this, but today, what we're going to go ahead and do is send this PowerPoint to you. So if you're trying to figure out how to get these or what they are, you'll have access to this whole PowerPoint slide, so you can kind of look at it later on. I will say on filtering, it's a family decision. Kids are different ages. I need you to be aware, just like I am as a director here, smart kids are going to get around stuff. And so I don't want you to get the false sense of security. If you did one of these or chose one of these for your kids, they won't find a way around it. But every family situation is different. Every kid's maturity level is different. If you do decide to go with the uh, filtering on that, that's completely a call that you make it won't affect what they do at school. For some parents who, who will do the agreements as what they talk about, some will do the, the safety, some that just want monitoring software, and some that just want filtering. Those are just all concepts or as we go through these talks for you to consider as a parent, um, what is best for your family. I know Ms. Moore has to leave at 9 a.m. Um, I'll stay about for five more minutes just to see if there are any big questions for the group you may have on today's presentation. Yeah. I have so many, I don't even know where to start. So can I just give you a couple? Sure. Um, first one you spoke about the safe, uh, safe searches on Google. Yep. Where, where do you find that setting? Uh, it's actually another you know, word is called settings. Oh, okay. uh, as, if you scroll down, you'll see it under settings or bottom right on YouTube. And, and that's within the app, once you're on the, on the website or the app, I mean, I'm just thinking desktop computers, how do you? At school, it's forced. So the settings yeah. actually push automatically. At home, they have to be logged in on Google. If they're logged in on Google, um, you can apply this, or you can just go to the Google search engine and you go click it one time to save it. The problem with that is the kids can go unsave it yeah. unless you've got to lock down. Some of these softwares, I believe QStudio does do that. So, so like it's kind of a force. If I have my computers, for example, if I logged into their Google accounts for school mm -hmm. because they use the interest. Correct. So now if they then go on to another website, would that still be kind of under the safe search umbrella of the school? Uh, it's actually most likely if they're using, logged in on the browser, on the yeah, Google account. The so then uh, it's my primary kid? Yeah. Yeah, so it's auto actually going to probably auto force that safe search right then and there. So if you would then, for example, they do rest, kids, whatever, and then later in the day come and watch a YouTube video. And so he's on that, that kind of filtering okay. automatically. But if he logs out at any time in his browser, it's the browser, not the Google account. Yeah, you have to be actually logged in on your Google Chrome browser as an account. If it logs out of it, it'll fall off. Yeah. Uh, can I say something? Because uh, what I have found uh, from parents that sometimes have problems, for instance, accessing, typing blog or something, is because they have the browser with the Gmail account of the parent, and then they try with the kids, so the <coughs> browser gets confused yeah. who is logging in. Yeah. So the idea would be to have a browser for the kid with the school account and a different profile with your account, so you yeah. don't have that problem to who is here. Yeah, there are, there's a number of ones that can actually force that in, or um, at least at minimum alert you if they're searching for things that they shouldn't be. Uh, just one other thing to make sure I'm just going to You spoke about uh, the fact that the school uh, accounts, they've got all those different applications that they use within the school account. So we have that. Our browser is always sort of set to that child's email account. And my daughter, for example, likes to write stories. So when she then goes and logs in there in the afternoon, she just feels like writing a story. Does that set it to her school account? Is that something that I, is, it's difficult to know exactly because what I have seen sometimes is that the students say, oh, but I saved it, but were you in your account or in your parents' account? Oh, no. Okay, so they need to 
know exactly when they see the Google Drive, for instance, that they are using their account. So they should know because the, the folders are created, some of the folders are created by us. So they should see the Google Drive with their, the format that they know when they are saving, but they need to know where they are saving. Okay, I mean, is that a problem that they're doing that sort of thing, or does that need to be kept specifically for school? Obviously, no, no. no. they're okay. No. Any other questions? Hi, uh, about uh, uh, laptops going to offset for secondary school. Is there a um, school insurance uh, thing that we can sign up for? No, because the school would not does not own the laptop, so there's no way we can claim insurance on it. I, um, you, as a parent, if you somehow can find a policy, I'm not familiar with it. You can get in Sri Lanka. That's a great thing. Uh, this only happens, this is like a once or twice a year thing where we can have a kid basically drop a laptop off a locker with another locker there, or they, for whatever reason, brought it out to the field and got it hit by a ball. It happens, but it's a really rare thing. We're talking once, two times a year, I'll hear of an incident like this at that occurred. More than anything else that will happen is the kids will kind of load it up with uh, viruses, they'll drop it, uh, or they, you know, they take it in their book bag and then they just throw their book bag around, and the next thing you open up and the screen is cracked. That's why you're probably buying really, really good padded book bags that make laptops is a good investment to do because there's cheap ones that, yeah, I can drop it from here and it'll be okay. And there's the more expensive ones that are kind of like an R box or an iPad where I can drop it from three or four or five feet and it can survive. But on the school level, we have nothing because we actually don't own the laptop, so we never have an insurance policy for it. And what, what grade did they make the laptop? Sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? So we do have Minecraft, but it is a lot more of a team-based on it. Uh, we've talked about coding before. In the curriculum, in ninth grade, the kids actually do a programming project. And then this year is our first year of DP Computer Science, which I'm all excited about because I can teach it. It's a little more uh, upper level, which is, I, I find entertaining. They have a whole programming component to it as well. Primary school? Primary school. We do level Grade five, right? Uh, grade five, for instance, last year we started with KG and Dash and Dot. Through the that's program. in that's during the, the no, no, no. During classes, okay. uh, that's part of what we are trying to instill. We, we started with KG, and we are trying to start moving up the coding, starting with little kids and little uh, apps like that and all, and some other apps that are appropriately for little kids, and then moving up. Yeah. But we should consider it for, for extracurricular activities. Yeah, we, we constantly jump around that. We're always on yeah, the There is a website called Tinker, so yeah. parents who are interested could always sort of pay a monthly fee, and if you can have we can have a facilitator um, to sort of, you know, get the kids to, to tinker around a little bit with it. I think that would be nice as well as an add as an add-on. We're always open to new ways to say so that we're constantly changing. It's a great part about the school that it's something we're very proud of and just how many ASAs we offer. But I mean, uh, obviously, if we feel like it's enough and an interest on kids, probably get added to it at, at some point. And it is actually covered through the curriculum as I said as well. Is given by the school to how much time secondary students are spending on their laptops after school? Like, has there been any questioning? So, we do have a homework policy, which then, depending on the assignments, is, is what the kids will do. But there's a homework policy set for how much time each instructor can have for a class. Okay. Whether they're using a laptop or whether they're using paper and pencil or they're building something, that just entirely depends on the subject, the class, the teacher. There is no blanket thing where we can say, you can only use homework assignments a max of 30 minutes, because it's just, it'd be almost impossible to be able to coordinate, well, I'm doing this assignment for 30 minutes, so you can't do this assignment for that for 30 minutes for laptops. It would be yeah. unmanageable on but it. But I think that in the way that you ask kids, you know, which social media sites they use, you know, you could maybe do some sort of questioning on how many hours they're spending. And for example, now in some of the grades, the math textbook is now downloaded onto their laptops. So not only are the children doing um, homework online and looking at Manage Back online and uploading stuff, their homework online, they're now looking at textbooks online. And I think that, that can really run into hours in the evening, which is not necessarily just the thing that they have to do. It's everything around that is also on the laptop. <coughs> I think that I just think 
I think the whole point of the tech talks this year is to have this ongoing conversation yeah. about things like this. The math change that just happened this year, from what I understand, the math textbook being online. So you're right, we will have to take that into consideration. But we're not making any major changes you know, right now. We're just having these six tech talks throughout the year to really talk about these things. Um, next tech talk is November 1st, and we'll be talking about how to set boundaries as parents. Um, we did a survey of all grade 5 through 12 of how much technology they use in school and out. And so Mr. Prento and I will be presenting those, that data, and talking about how to set boundaries as parents. But I think, um, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, and I think it's something that every time something gets brought up in the Tech Talk, we want to address it at the next Tech Talk or have another Tech Talk devoted to that. So we hear what you're saying, and, and we appreciate you being here and giving us your opinion. Um, but this is an ongoing, year-long conversation. Uh, I think they, they have to run because they both have meetings, but maybe we can give